this idea of green industrial strategy is something that both countries really want to, to make work because the, the politics are favorable to them locally. You're listening to the USSC Briefing Room, a podcast from the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, where we give you a seat at the table for a USSC briefing on the latest developments in US news and foreign policy. We'll cover what you need to know and what's beneath the surface of the news. Hello, I'm Mari Kirk, Director of Engagement and Impact at the United States Study Center. Thank you for joining us on the USSC Briefing Room today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're recording on today. The University of Sydney is located on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. One year ago, following the meeting President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Anthony Albanese had on the sidelines of the Quad Summit in Japan, the leaders announced a third pillar of the Australia-US alliance, the Climate, Critical Minerals, and Clean Energy Transformation Compact. What does this compact involve, and how much progress has been made in the past year? And what will happen to this pillar of the alliance if former President Trump is re-elected this coming November? To discuss these questions, I'm joined by USSC non-resident fellow Lachlan Carey. Lachlan is a manager at the Rocky Mountain Institute, where he leads work on U.S. regional energy development through clean energy investment. Earlier in his career, he was an economist at the Australian Treasury Department, and he has an excellent understanding of the clean energy ecosystem in both the United States and Australia. So he's very well placed to speak to us. So thank you so much, Lachlan, for being here with us today. Thank you. It's great to be back on the pod. Yeah, we're very glad to have you. And of course, as always, we'll uh, get your by the numbers stat at the end. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. And so just to kick off, um, can you please tell us about the Australia United States Climate Critical Minerals and Clean Energy Transformation Compact? And what do we know about it now that we didn't know when it was first announced in May of last year? It's, it's a great question. And it's a particularly interesting question to answer in, in the week that uh, the Albanese government has delivered its big future made in Australia budget, right? Because if we look at the opening paragraph of the, the Australia-US Climate Compact, um, it, it says that the goal is to drive action both at home and abroad. And we've clearly seen right, a $22.7 billion worth of tax credits and, and related spending in, in the budget very much fits squarely within the kind of realm of what the uh, compact is trying to do and, you know, is both motivated by, but also in a sense, uh, kind of competing with um, the U.S.'s uh, actions two years ago in the Inflation Reduction Act, Chips and Science Act, but partisan infrastructure law before that. And so what you see is, is two countries really in a sort of state of symbiosis right now, ideologically, politically, um, and it says geostrategically, and the compact kind of you know, pulls all of that together in in a really interesting way. And so, in that sense, you know, I'd say um, it's it's in some ways more, uh, more meaningful than a lot of what we get out of you know leaders summits, multilateral uh, events. In that, you know, it's it's a piece of paper that I think represents a real ideological shift and inflection point for both of these countries, the way they're thinking about climate change, the way they're thinking about China, about economic policy, uh, about the future of the sort of global trade regime. I mean, these are really big questions. And the compact itself isn't designed necessarily to sort of shift those. But what it is designed to do is say to the world, hey, this is where we agree. These are the things we're going to work on together. And so I think we're starting to see that open space at home for a country like Australia that relies so much on the US to, to be able to pass its own, own policies in line with that agenda. And we also see pieces of that taking place on the global stage in you know, forums like the G20, where you really see Australia and the US in lockstep on a lot of issues related to, to climate, clean energy, and critical minerals. Oh. And I guess... We've had the Australia-US uh, alliance for you know decades or over seventy years old now, uh, and we had the you know kind of defense security pillar of the alliance first, then the economic pillar. Uh, but why do you think action on climate change and critical minerals was established as an additional third pillar to this long-standing alliance? Yeah, I think there's the 
local and global answer to that question, right? Um, locally, I think the compact represents the intersection of all these these big policy issues that both countries are trying to tackle at once that don't neatly fit in the economic or the national security pillars of the alliance. And again, I'm talking about obviously the climate crisis itself, but also um, key elements of uh, you know what's called industrial policy. This idea of targeting strategic industries, something that both the US and Australia are suddenly very interested in doing. Um, obviously, the trade regime. You, you know, just uh, yesterday you saw President Biden stuff a whole bunch of new tariffs on Chinese clean energy technologies, and so you're seeing that intersection between geopolitical competition, industrial policy, climate change, all sort of you know being melted into to a pot. And the compact, I think, is designed to get at that, and is giving both countries a sort of uh, mechanism for thinking through those those big questions together. Bilateral, and then I think the global answer to that question is, is as I said, you know, this creates a united front for Australia and the U.S. to kind of, you know, get their talking points straight, say that they're uh, they're working on on key projects or initiatives, and then bring those those ideas and bring those initiatives to broader groupings where it's much harder to get consensus. And so I'm, you know, talking particularly. Uh, forums within the region. Um, you know, you've got the new Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Wherever that goes, that's clearly an area that you know, if Biden is is uh, elected into a, to a second term, but I think that type of modern trade agreement, as they they call it, uh, you know, will will be a priority for for the administration. They're going to need an ally like Australia to back them up, and that's that's I think what the compact. Is really about. And I think that's why you get this sort of elevation to, to pillar status, you know, we could call it. Um, and you know, we haven't seen that necessarily in in other countries. Uh, I think it it speaks to this this very similar political moment that both countries in, are in, and that and a similar sort of ideological moment, right? When we think about climate and clean energy, Australia and the US are remarkably similar countries. We're very very different from say the EU for one very, very big reason. And it's we're both fossil fuel exporters. Uh, you know, the US is the world's largest oil producer now, and Australia is, you know, at times the among the world's largest coal and gas exporters. So this creates a, a structurally different political economy in which to pass climate action. And one in which both the Biden administration and the Albanese government have landed on this idea of, you know, renewable energy super of job creation, of reshoring manufacturing and investment uh, to both countries, and in so doing, providing the kind of political cover to pass really ambitious climate legislation. Now, the EU hasn't had to do that because it's an energy import. Uh, the relationship with Canada and Mexico is slightly different because they share borders. Um, both, you know, big fossil fuel producers, but, but there's a different set of uh, kind of engagements there uh, for them uh, to work on. And so the specific pieces of what's included in this compact very much speak to uh, this kind of political ideology, this economic ideology, green industrial strategy as a, as a means of passing ambitious climate policy. Mm. And it's interesting to think about the sort of unique similarities that the countries share and how that might bring them into closer alignment. Uh, do other countries have similar arrangements with the United States and Australia as this climate compact? Do other similar arrangements exist between those countries and other countries, or are they more different if they exist? Yeah, so to my knowledge, there's no um, hierarchy or framework of, of you know different agreements. I'm sure that uh, there's a poor political science PhD out there somewhere trying to to figure that that out, but. Yeah, what you do see is is this sort of um, you know plethora of of various arrangements that the U.S. administration is is making to try and find the pieces where their their interests align, and so um, they have a, there's a climate and nature. Uh, it's not called a compact. I think it's just an agreement. Whether there's a hierarchical difference there, I, I couldn't say. Um, with with Canada, that you know, I think speak to to the particular interests of 
between the Biden and, and Trudeau administrations. There's uh, an energy ministerial, like Australia has um, an energy ministerial with uh, Korea, um, and the EU has an ongoing energy dialogue, and they have a particular uh, green steel and trade agreement that they've been trying to hash out for you know a couple of years now. So all these different pieces speak to this kind of fragmentation of, of climate diplomacy globally, where you know the action is really happening and happening in this piecemeal fashion, right? Sector by sector, region by region, bilateral relationship by bilateral relationship. Um, in this in this way that's you know for someone like me that tries to keep taps on all this very uh, kind of convoluted and, and uh, tough to, to manage, but but I think important because what it what it says is that countries are trying to solve real problems. They're not trying to sort of signal progress and, and make kind of grand sweeping statements about when they're going to meet you know net zero targets um, without putting any money behind them or any mechanism for how to get there. And they're instead saying, okay, Australia and the US both have an interest in green hydrogen. Let's figure out what green means. Let's figure out how we transport this stuff. Let's figure out how we import this stuff. Let's uh, let's figure out um, you know how to to monitor twenty four seven clean electricity and how to to match the uh, renewable electricity that's produced to the hydrogen that's produced. You know, really technical, difficult questions that I think the compact starts to provide the framework for for like minded countries uh, to answer. And so I think that's what we're we're seeing, um, you know, in a really interesting. Mm. And you've touched on this a little bit already uh, in terms of their desire to uh, solve real problems and not just signal intent. Um, and you mentioned the example of green hydrogen. But for this third pillar of the US-Australia alliance in particular, what does each country stand to gain from this compact? And would you say that their priorities are aligned or would they be operating in tension with each other in any way? No, again, I think Australia is in a great position here because our interests and our our strategies is really well aligned with with that of the US. Um, you know, I think I mentioned the politics. This idea of green industrial strategy is something that both countries really want to to make work because the, the politics are favourable to them locally. Um, economically. You know, Australia obviously stands to gain from uh, opening up a huge export market for its critical minerals, potentially for green hydrogen and derived products like low low carbon fuels and you know potentially green ammonia, um, green metals, that sort of thing. So that's yeah, that's a huge opportunity, but also foreign direct investment uh, into Australia, of which the, the US is by far the, the largest source. You know, for things like critical minerals processing green hydrogen uh, facilities, a lot of uh, renewable energy, you know, Australia is going to need uh, the capital from the US and the tech transfer from from the US to make to make this stuff happen. Um, for the US, obviously, the economic case isn't, isn't quite as strong, Australia being such a small market relative um, to, to the US's size, but it is an important source of, of critical minerals and the way that a bunch of the provisions within the Inflation Reduction Act are written is that uh, the components and the and the critical minerals into, for instance, uh, battery technologies have to come from uh, allied countries and can't come from, for example, China. Uh, and Australia is obviously well positioned, uh, you know, within a number of critical minerals and, and rare earths to be that that supplier and potentially to move up the value chain as well. And then finally, I would say that. Again, you know this realm of uh, of diplomacy and um, and foreign policy in a lot of ways is about sort of shifting the ocean with shifting the norms of what the kind of uh, rules of engagement are within international forums. And for so long, those rules have been you know all about free trade, deregulation, the so-called Washington Consensus. And the Biden administration has literally come out with a quote new Washington Consensus that that spells out its new rules of engagement, its its new sense of what international norms should look like. And those norms are very aligned with what uh, the Albanese government, anyway, what its domestic agenda and 
to a large extent international agenda looks like, which is great industrial strategy, which is uh, diversifying supply chains, improving resilience in supply chains, um, you know, helping the global south through uh, de-risking private investment, and and so on. And so I think these um, this uh, sort of aligned front here is a is a key sort of win for both countries in that Australia can be you know better tied to the U.S. and its sort of security and economic provider. And the U.S. has a sort of trusted ally that can back it in these international forums. Um, and so I think that's sort of the final win for both sides. Yeah. And you've also touched on this a bit in terms of we've heard announcements in the Australian budget uh, that relate to um, initiatives relative, um, relevant to this compact. And we've also seen through the Inflation Reduction Act measures uh, and um, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, um, actions that the Biden government is taking. But where would you say we've seen most progress on uh, initiatives related to this compact over the last 12 months? You know, I think you stole my answer there, which is you know, domestic. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> um, yeah. You know, I think it's it's hard to point to, to significant um, kind of pieces to, to hang on to the compact itself. For the very simple reason that a the US is in an election year and has decided that in that election year it doesn't want to rock the boat boat too much on uh, a lot of these these sort of trade and, and Washington consensus issues. B, uh-huh. you know, its uh, sort of state capacity, attention, and resources have been uh, diverted. You know, particularly with the you know Russia Ukraine war and, and more recently the the uh, Israel. Gaza crisis, and so I think that has um, has sort of reduced the appetite of, of this administration to pursue its amb- ambitious sort of new Washington consensus. And we've seen that, for example, with iPads. I think there's been a lot less momentum on that front than than people maybe had expected. Uh, and wow. um, so I, I think yeah, we've seen less sort of deliverables. As, as we might put it, but what we have seen is uh, continued commitment on both sides to this to this agenda, right? You know, if we look at the four objectives of uh, the compact, it's accelerating the expansion and diversification of clean energy supply chains. Again, we've seen that just this week in the budget in the U.S. tariffs on China. It's promoting responsible, sustainable, and stable supply of critical minerals. I mean, this was a key feature of the Future Made in Australia Act. Um, I mean, well, we're not, we haven't seen the act yet, but we, we know some of what's going to be included in it, including a, a new tax credit for critical, critical minerals processing and refining investments. Um, driving the development of emerging battery technologies. Uh, so in the US, you've seen Loan Programs Office, for example. I think um, my last count was $27 billion worth of loan um, guarantees or, or direct loans to uh, something like 27 projects. In the US, we've seen the Loan Programs Office handing out billions of dollars to, to new projects uh, in emerging battery technologies. You have significant investments from Department of Energy, Research, Alba, um, in those uh, in those technologies as well. And then finally, the final objective of the, of the compact is to support the development of emerging markets for, for clean hydrogen. And, you know, we've now seen both countries decide to introduce a hydrogen production tax credit. So that's uh, a huge, huge start. Um, the next question, I think, for the, for the compact and, and, and both countries will be uh, finding sources of offtake, sources of demand for all that, that green hydrogen. And that's still a bit of an unread question and somewhere where I'd hope the compact can, can start to make some real progress in the future. Wow. So we've seen um, a lot of uh, initiative taken on these domestic issues. A lot of things have happened um, in both countries, not so much on those deliverables, as you mentioned. I guess what sort of what grade would you give on the progress we've seen to date? If you were doing a you know one year on progress or co- pro- progress report or report card, what grade would you give it? Give it a B plus. Uh, a B plus. Okay. Respectable. Yeah, re- respectable, <laughs> right? In in the sense that, 
I think the compact still looks good a year later, which isn't always the case with these these things. Right? I think both countries have, have shown really strong commitment to the underlying principles within mm. the compact itself. And, and so I think it, it still acts as this, um, you know, almost accountability mechanism um, for for the priorities of, of both countries, which I personally think is really important because for me, the only way we're going to get anywhere on climate in Australia and the US is if we do a good job of uh, creating jobs in these these industries of the future. And and if we don't, then uh, I think that's going to set climate action back all, all over again. And, and the con, compact can act as, you know, one accountability mechanism as, as one source of um, you know, new projects and, and new initiatives, then, then I think that's that's a big success. But on the other hand, I um, you know I think it, it has to be uh, below an, an A. Let's put it that way because it hasn't made a lot of tangible pro- progress sort of under the remit of the the compact itself. Um, I don't think there's too many yeah. new projects, new investments, um, new initiatives that we can sort of uh, directly attribute to the, to the PAPS sort of signing the compact. And, and I mean, especially it is hard in an election year, as you mentioned. I'm keen to get your thoughts on how deeply entrenched you think this newest pillar um, of the alliance is compared to the other two pillars, defense and economics. And um, in the context of an election, if former President Trump is elected to a second term, how secure is this compact in particular. We remember that one of the first things that President Trump did when he was elected the first time was to withdraw from the Paris Accords. Would we anticipate something similar or, yeah, what, is is this compact safe? Is this pillar of the alliance safe? Or would you say that there are risks around it based on the outcome of this election? Well, I hope you're, you're not trying to get me into election prognostication here, Marie, because I know that can, can get people <laughs> into into trouble. So I'll, um, you know, uh, sort of draw inspiration from The Economist in, in me and give you a, on the one hand, on the other uh, answer. But, you know, I think it's clearly the most fragile of the three pillars. Um, and I don't think there's there's any any doubt about that. But I, I do think it was designed in a way that... Um, at least some of it will survive regardless of the outcome in November. Um, again, if you, if you look at those, those sort of four objectives, you know, supply chains, I think remains uh, a priority under uh, either administration, critical minerals, same again, battery technologies, the Trump administration, uh, Trump campaign has, has come out pretty strong against EVs. So there's certainly a risk to that one, but, um, I do think there's enough capital invested in in the U.S. Um, that EVs are, are here to stay, and um, so there'll be uh, certainly pushback from from large automakers and other uh, large companies to keep um, sort of some policy momentum on that front. And then finally, hydrogen, same thing. A lot of capital invested from uh, oil and gas companies. Who has been um, from recent reports out of Mar-a-Lago, our uh, close friends with uh, Canada Trump, and um, and I think they have a lot of interest in uh, in hydrogen. Um, you'll notice that in my description of all those four objectives, I didn't use words like clean um, or climate, and so I think that's you know would obviously be the big big difference. And if you read, for example, Project Twenty Twenty Five, this this report out of the Heritage Foundation describing all the things that, that it thinks the Trump administration should do. You know, it's very, very uh, unapologetic in its descriptions of just how much it's going to uh, erase climate uh, from the you know, US federal government agenda. So I think Australia would have to be pretty strategic in how it sets up these these ideas. But, you know, if we sort of zoom out again to those uh, the sort of big ideas that I think the compact is, is getting at, China, whether it's the you know post free trade uh, regime, uh, or whether it's industrial strategy, yeah, these are areas that Biden and Trump have actually been surprisingly kind of close on, right? Um, well, you know, uh, it was 
Biden has held on to most of the the tariffs against China and has, has just decided to increase uh, a lot of them. And um, you know, you, I I don't think a Trump administration has anything like the same commitment to kind of free market or, or neoliberal principles that that his Republican predecessors had. So I I do think there is there is scope to hold on to to quite a bit uh, of the compact. It's going to need a pretty significant rebranding. Hello. Wow. So maybe it's more about, it would be about the framing, but a lot of the desired outcomes would be the same. And obviously concern around things like shoring up um, supply chains uh, and, and the pragmatic or economic focus, that is where we see that alignment uh, between both uh, candidates. So yeah, it sounds like a lot of things, the outcome might be similar, but the, the way it's talked about could be quite different. And I do think there will be important differences in those uh, the outcomes for specific technologies. I mean, hydrogen, for example, um, you know, the hydrogen sector will look very different if those rules of the road are written by oil and gas companies um, versus if they're, they're written by, um, you know, regulators and, um, and technical experts interested in accelerating decarbonization. We're seeing that in the design of the hydrogen production tax credit in the U.S., I think we'll see a similar debate happen in, the, uh, in Australia this, this winter. Um, so that's a wide example where, you know, I do think the, the devil, you know, is in the details for a lot of these, uh, these technologies. But if you zoom out far enough, I think um, you can get to a point of uh, reasonable alignment to, to others. Mm. And the more that Australia can be on the front foot and, you know, prepare for that and strategic about that, then they can set themselves up to hopefully prevent any potential hiccups or issues um, along the way. Yeah, I think that's that's right. And, you know, exactly um, place for, for a U.S. study center and, and think tanks to kind of get ahead of it and, and help them, you know, build this plane while they're flying it, which is, is really what I think is happening. The U.S. is, is very open to, to suggestions and, and good policy ideas and I think that's an area in which Australia can can excel and, and help kind of set this green industrial strategy agenda with the US rather than you know always being a policy taker, uh, if you will. True. Well, yeah. And one thing that Australia has historically done quite well is having that strong relationship with the US. I mean, that sense of mateship and the alliance goes beyond uh, you know, just a piece of paper, but there is a real affinity and a bond. And I think under the previous Trump administration, Australia fared better than just about any other country, if not any other country, um, in terms of working well with that government. And now similarly with the Biden administration, uh, we're seeing both countries very well aligned. So I think Australia has a good track record of doing that. And so much of it is about adapting the relationship uh, to work and make sure that we're aligned on the things that matter. Yeah, totally agree. Um, all right. So just uh, then as we wrap up, I would love to get your by the numbers stat. What have you chosen for us today? So I cheated a little bit and, and uh, picked two, which was 25% and 18%, which 25% okay. is the US's share of our foreign direct investment. So nearly a quarter of all foreign direct investment into Australia comes from the US. Um, and 18% is the share of our exports that, that go to China. And so to me, wow. these two numbers speak to the interesting kind of uh, economic trade-off potentially between the existing sort of fossil fuel regime where, where Australia benefits from selling lots of uh, coal, gas, and, and iron ore to, to China and a future clean um, investment regime where we, we see a lot more foreign direct investment coming from from the United States. And you know, the big difference between those those two is one is a future on which Australia is just another commodity exporter vulnerable to to you know spikes and swings in uh, commodity super cycles and not sort of competing in particularly complex industries. And the other is is one of which we embrace a future of um, technological innovation um, you know and and capital in investment. And so uh, those are my two numbers. Great. Well, that's fantastic and very helpful context for uh, this wider conversation. 
And now I'd just like to point out a couple of other podcasts that may be of interest to our listeners. Our CEO, Dr. Michael Green, is co-host of the Asia Chessboard podcast with Jude Blanchett, the Freeman Chair for China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I'd also recommend checking out the USSC Live podcast series that runs recordings for our major live events, including our 2024 Election Watch events. Um, you can find these uh, on our website at uscc.edu.au or wherever you get your podcasts. Lachlan, thank you so much for your time today. It's been great to chat with you. Thank you, Rory.